Okay, so uh, let's talk about um, chapter three. Chapter three, we're going to talk about motion in two dimensions, where before we were focusing on acceleration, velocity, and uh, positions uh, with respect to time in only one direction. So we either studied the x direction or we studied, studied the y direction. So in chapter three, we're going to put the two together. So if you look at this rock and this uh, girl throws this rock over the edge of the bridge and you want to have it land on the two by four that's floating down the river, we have to calculate the rock's motion in the x direction and also in the y direction. So we actually in most cases will do those two calculations separately and then put them together and that'll help us to predict um, you know how hard you have to throw the rock at what angle and stuff like that. So before we can jump into that though we'll need to know about components of motion, uh, vector addition and subtraction, and then um, projectile motion itself, and then relative velocity. And so object, an object of motion on a plane can be located using two numbers, the x and y coordinates, uh, and that's basically its position. Similar, similarly, I can't talk today, its velocity, velocity can be described as components along the x and y axis. In other words, if you look at this image here, this, um, this uh, object is in motion on a diagonal direction. However, we can separate that motion as a velocity in the x direction and a velocity in the y direction. And so the vector addition of those two will give you the overall velocity here. Well, what's the relationship? Well, whatever the velocity of this object is in the diagonal direction is really going to be broken up into its y component. So we could calculate that by the magnitude of the velocity times sine of theta, which is the angle of elevation. And then we can also find the x component of the velocity, and we call that velocity sub x is equal to v times the cosine of that angle theta. And if we're curious and we wanted to, like, let's say we knew the velocity in the y direction and the velocity in the x direction and we wanted to know the angle, we'd simply plug that in here. So arctan of velocity in the y direction over velocity in the x direction will actually give us our angle theta. So velocity components are x and y components, and like I said before, you could calculate them as the uh, total, or what we call the resultant velocity v times cosine of theta. And then the y component of velocity is equal to y, uh, v times sine of theta. And then the total magnitude of the velocity vector is, uh, this is the Pythagorean identity, but the total velocity vector is equal to the square root of v sub x squared plus v sub y squared, or the velocity in the x direction squared plus the velocity in the y direction squared, and we take the square root of all that. So the components of the displacement then are usually given in this form. Uh, x is equal to x naught plus vx times t, and the y position is equal to the initial y position plus vy times t. So it's the same equation, it's just we're separating the x's and y's. These can be calculated separately. So if we go back a couple of graphs and we said that we can calculate where this rock will be, what we do is we use these equations right here to help us calculate those two velocities and then that will give us the magnitude of the result the resultant velocity. So the equations of motion then are, are very similar to what they were in one dimension. Uh, this is the same, uh, x equals x naught plus the velocity, but remember because we're calculating it with the x, we say um, v sub x naught times t plus one half times the acceleration in the x direction, uh, t squared. Um, the y is similar, y equals y naught plus v sub y naught times t plus one half the acceleration in the y direction times t squared. And then the separate velocity component vectors for uh, the x and y components. Um, usually this is what we would use most of the time. And uh, time is common for both. So if we go back um, to this rock, 
let's assume that it takes four seconds for the rock to hit the target. Well, the time will be the same for the rock traveling in the X direction as it would be for the time of the rock traveling in the Y direction. Time doesn't change. So it's going to be the same for both of those. So let's move forward a little bit here. And so what we're looking at is if the acceleration is not parallel to the velocity, then the object will move in a curve. So here we have an example of uh, a velocity of a ball going in this direction and then acceleration acting upon it in the y direction. And because there's acceleration in the y direction, what happens is that the ball will curve this way. So like if you play baseball and you put a spin on the curve, it actually causes an acceleration in one direction and that's what causes the ball to curve through the air. Same thing if you're playing pool and you put a curve on the ball, it causes the ball to accelerate in one direction and that's what causes the ball to curve. So in order to kind of calculate what we're doing, what we do is we separate the X and Y components using uh, kind of a triangular method. And so what we could do uh, for the resultant vector, in other words, if I have two vectors, I could draw them tip to tail. In other words, this vector A represents a velocity or any vector. It could be acceleration too. And vector B could represent another velocity. And so the resultant velocity of the two is if I draw them tip to tail. In other words, my resultant vector starts from here. Well, my vector A starts from here to here. And then at the head uh, or the tip of that vector, I would draw the tail of the next vector. And so A plus B will equal the resultant vector. And that's just going to go from the uh, tail of A to the tip of B. And so we use this to figure out different um, vector quantities. So to, let me explain what a vector is. A vector is a magnitude, which is the length of the arrow, and then it can have a positive or negative direction. So for example, if this blue line is vector A and this purple line is vector B, because it's going in this down direction, we would say that that's minus B. Well, positive B would have the same magnitude or length as B, but would be in the exact opposite direction. And so when we say vector A plus vector B, we would go from A to B, and then the resultant vector or some of the two would come from the tip of A, or from the tail of A all the way to the tip of B. Now, if I were to say the vector A minus vector B, I would go from A, now because it's negative, it's a full 180 degree rotation, and I would come down here, and then I would draw the line from the tail of A to the tip of B. So this dotted blue line, dark blue line, is the resultant vector of A plus B, where this shorter blue line is the resultant vector of A minus B. So what we like to do in physics is our resultant vector is the sum of the X component, which we would call A in this case, and our Y component, which we would call B. The length of the arrow represents the magnitude of both vectors. And so if I wanted to find the magnitude of C, in other words, let's assume that A is a velocity in this direction, B is a velocity in this direction, and C is the overall velocity of the object. So if we were to go back to this picture here, where I have this ball that has a velocity that's going on an angle in a straight path, that could be broken down into two components. We could pretend that this is the velocity of the ball that has an X velocity and a Y velocity. And if you notice, it makes a right angle triangle. So to solve for the magnitude of C, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, uh, you know, a, a squared plus B squared equals C squared. And then in this particular case, remember the tangent is the opposite over the adjacent. So if this is my angle theta here, then theta would be equal to arctan of the opposite, which is vector B, over the adjacent, which is vector A.
So we could break this down. The component vector, whatever it is, would always be broken down into the x component by c cos of um, theta. In other words, if I know the magnitude of this vector, I can find c sub x by taking c and multiplying it by cosine of theta. I could also find the y value by multiplying c times sine of theta. Uh, again, if I wanted to, I could come in here and uh, find the angle theta if I had the y component of c and the x component of c. So now let's look at vectors and how they can be written. A vector is just a arrow uh, that represents a magnitude and the angle that it is in is going to be the direction. So we could also break down the magnitude of that into what we call a unit vector. So a capital letter A represents the vector, capital or lowercase a with a hat on it, sometimes Mr. Adams will call it a hat, is the unit vector. And if we go and rotate that vector a full 180 degrees, then we would say negative a or negative a hat. So what we could do is vectors can be resolved into components and components added separately then be recombined for the component vector. So here we have a velocity that's on an angle and another velocity on an angle and we want to find the total magnitude of the velocity and the total angle of the two. Well that's simple. If I take f sub 1 and break it down into its x and y components and I take f sub 2 which is this vector here and break it down into its x and y components the resultant vector f equals f sub 1 plus f sub 2 is equal to the sum of all the x components and all the y components. So this is done most easily if all vectors start at the origin. So what we like to do in physics is we try to orientate our problem so the vectors start at the origin and then it makes it a little easier for us. So for example, I have a vector that goes this way and I have a vector that goes this way. If I add up the sum of the x vectors and the y vectors, I'll get a resultant vector. Um, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, also, it, the resultant vector should always be the x and y components of the tip. So if you look at this example, the tip here, whatever that x and y value of that particular point on the coordinate plane, is the magnitude of this vector which is the y component and the magnitude of this vector which is magnitude and direction of this vector which is the x component. So when I look at a ball that's been thrown off the side of a building as the ball travels the x and y components are going to vary because anything in free fall will have an acceleration due to gravity, right? And so what happens is, is that my velocity, because the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared, and it's going downward, notice that my y component of velocity is increasing. So what I'm saying is the arrow pointing down keeps getting longer. However, we don't have any acceleration in the x direction. So if you look at the length of my v sub x naught um, vector quantity, it doesn't change at all. So a lot of times when we do projectile motion, the x components, once they're calculated, there's usually no increase or decrease in their acceleration or velocity. They just kind of maintain in the x direction. In fact, the only thing that really changes is their velocities uh, in the y direction due to acceleration of uh, gravity. And so the velocity uh, goes faster and faster towards the center of the Earth. So when I hit a golf ball, Whatever my initial velocity is, if I break it up into the velocity components, uh, velocity in the x direction and the velocity in the y direction, if we take snapshots in time, notice that my velocity in the x direction remains the same. However, the acceleration due to gravity, which points down, will lower my velocity in the y direction. A little bit later on, my velocity in the x direction remains the same. However, my velocity in the y direction is slowing down because the acceleration due to gravity is a constant 9.8 meters per second and it's pointing down. Right at the peak of the projectile motion, 
my y velocity is zero but my x velocity is still the same so the ball is still in motion but it's not traveling any higher and it's not traveling any lower at this instant in time because the acceleration is still pointing downward the velocity in the y direction will begin to go downward so here if we look a little bit further in a snapshot in time I start to see a negative y velocity however my x velocity is still the same um, as time progresses acceleration operates on the ball causing it to speed up in the negative direction so my y velocity increases but it's pointing down towards earth and then lastly just before the hill the ball hits the uh, ground we have a y velocity pointing down that is the exact opposite usually uh, as the initial y component and the x velocity is pretty much the same as it was when it began uh, the resultant vectors are also um, it, they've been rotated uh, 90 degrees usually so this velocity will go uh, it'll, it'll have the same angle of elevation but depending on how you look at it. in other words this angle here will be the same as this angle here okay and so the range of the object um, the range of the object and this is a term that you guys need to know is the range of the object is always going to be the total distance um, that the ball travels on level ground so if I'm standing on the edge of the cliff and I throw a ball up in the air at an angle of 45 degrees or I throw a ball down at an angle of 45 degrees um, because the ball is in motion here uh, it will be in the air a little bit longer because it takes uh, gravity a little bit longer to act on the ball and then at some point in time uh, the acceleration due to gravity changes the y velocity the y component of the velocity and then it eventually falls to the ground uh, here because it's already going downward the y component just j they just keep going down further and further what we see here is that the range of the projectile is maximum if there is no air resistance at a launch of 45 degrees uh, there's an equation for that that I'll show you guys a little bit later on but it's just basically based on uh, the equation that has a uh, sine in it and so sine is at its max at 90 degrees and so this equation has sine double theta and uh, 45 degrees would give you the 90 degrees and that's when sine reaches its maximum value um, notice also though that the complementary angles have the same range in other words 75 degrees has the same range as 15 degrees 60 degrees has the same range as 30 degrees and 45 has the same as 45 so that's also based on the periodic behavior of sine so now if there is a little bit of air resistance um, that may change based on the way that the air resistance is moving however it's still going to be the minimum effect if there's air resistance pushing one direction or the other direction it does have a little bit of effect but it's minimal um, we'll stop right there for now and then uh, I'll do the rest later.